Hello there. Welcome to Just the Dis. My name is Brian. We talk about Blu-rays here. And I have the old new disc box. So we're going to do an update. A little collection update. I'm going to start big with one of my favorite releases of 2021. This is amazing. Uh, Over the Edge, 1979, directed by Jonathan Kaplan, written by Charlie Haas and Tim Hunter, who would obviously go on to direct River's Edge uh, and Tex with Matt Dillon. Um, This is, like I said, truly one of my favorites and gets better every time I watch it. And this is the Arrow UK edition of the film. But know that despite it not being easy to get in the States at the moment... It is region free, as you can see down there. So it can be played anywhere in the world. You just need to import it. And trust me, I'm telling you, it is worth importing. This is beyond criterion level stuff. And like I said, one of my favorites of 2021 so far. Look at these extras. We'll get into those in a second. Um, Here's the alternate uh, artwork. And for those who don't know, Over the Edge is a teen rebellion drama, I guess, um, about a city called New Granada, which is loosely based on a real city that was sort of a planned community that did not take into account the fact that there would be a lot of teenagers uh, and they would have not very much to do, and that might end up causing... Some issues in terms of juvenile delinquency and crime and drug use and general boredom and destructiveness. So what you have is the story of a bunch of kids that live in this planned community uh, and how their parents are pretty checked out uh, in terms of dealing with them. Uh, The lead role is played by Michael Kramer. He plays Carl. He is friends with Matt Dillon, who makes his film debut in this film. He was discovered uh, as part of like broadcasting um, efforts made by the casting directors in New York, just combing high schools for kids. And one of the casting directors found him, and the rest is history. And he's great in this movie. He plays Richie. Um, and so Carl and Richie are getting themselves into trouble. A little bit, uh, and they are put into big trouble at the very beginning of the movie because we see two kids on an overpass shoot a cop car in the windshield with a BB gun. One of them is played by Vincent Spano, who is also a big part of this movie. Uh, And those kids then flee the scene and end up getting Carl and Richie in trouble uh, through just (laughs) the fact that they're ducking behind some brush to kind of hide themselves. Uh, Sergeant Doberman, uh, uh, actor Harry Northup, who is in Taxi Driver, among other things, but this is probably his best role ever. Um, He is sort of the local law enforcement that is always dealing with the kids and not really um, having a lot of patience with them. You can see him there grabbing Carl and Richie. And so it's just sort of like, you know, I used to say it was like kids before kids, the Harmony Corinne kids. Uh, And it kind of is that. Uh, I do like it way better than I like that movie. But yeah, it's just these kids sort of hanging out and doing drugs a little bit and dealing with each other and dealing with school and dealing with a general sense of alienation from their parents uh, and fighting with each other and having a big climactic ending I'm not going to talk about if you haven't seen the movie. Um, but it's great, really great movie, and it only gets better every time. The soundtrack is just fantastic. It's Cheap Trick, The Cars, uh, Van Halen. I mean, it's it's of the period, but it's still the Ramones. It's still really great, and I have the soundtrack as well. Um, but so it's just one of the great teen movies ever and one of the great movies of the 70s, Jonathan Kaplan's masterpiece. Uh, and as I said, it is stacked with stuff. Um, you have uh, a new archival in, uh, commentary that comes from the DVD with Jonathan Kaplan, producer George Leto, writers Tim Hunter and Charlie Haas, a new commentary with Michael Kramer and journalist Mike Sachs, which I totally dug. It was really neat to, to hear 
uh, Michael Kramer's thoughts, you know, this many years on uh, about the film. Um, and then there is an isolated music and effects track, the score, of course, done by Saul Kaplan, uh, Jonathan Kaplan's father, who was blacklisted. Um, and so that's really great. It's a really interesting effective score something called wide streets narrow minds an exclusive multi-part retrospective documentary with newly recorded interviews with the cast and crew and this is incredible because they really got so many people here um kaplan hunter haas talent scouts jane bernstein and linda pfefferman production designer jim newport matt dillon michael kramer harry northup vincent spano pamela ludwig she's on the cover there she's sort of the girl that uh, Carl is into, and she's really great in this movie as well. Um, let's see here. Uh, Tom Fergus, Julia Pomeroy, and others. Like, they got almost all the kids, you know, the the major kids, even the background kids, uh, like Claude and people like that get interviewed for this. And so that's really great to see all those guys show up. I mean, it is Zoom interviews, but I'm still happy to hear them, you know, reflect on their experiences. Then you have a full post-film Q&A from a 2010 screening at Walter Reed Theater in New York featuring George Little, uh, Hunter, Haas, Bernstein, uh, Spano, Northrup, and uh, co-star Andy Romano. Oh, no, I'm sorry. that uh, Northrup, Kramer, and Ludwig, Fergus, and Pomeroy. And then there's excerpts from the Projection Booth podcast uh, which includes um, interviews with Haas, Spano, Northrup, Hunter and Andy Romano and welcome to new Granada, a full rock op operetta by Dratz. Uh, it's like an album of music, a rock opera inspired by, uh, over the edge, which is great. Uh, text materials, including original production notes, 2000 vice oral history by Mike Sachs, destruction, fun or dumb, the full educational film that you see in the movie, which is pretty great. Um, at us theatrical and TV spots, UK VHS promo, German theatrical trailer, uh, including, uh, let's see here, includes the original Mouse Packs screenplay. And so it's great. It's just a great release. I anticipated it would be great, but it lived up to my expectations. And even if Criterion had done this, it wouldn't be as good as this. So can't give this a higher recommendation. Um, Easily top, top stuff for this year. Moving on. A little something from Arbelos Films, which is a company I respect quite a lot. They do great work, and uh, they do impeccable restorations. This is called Son, whoops, Son of the White Mare. And this has uh, got a cool slipcase that's like an envelope that you pop open and you pull out your disc and there is a it's an animated film uh, so you have a sort of a a pull out of the different characters in the different parts of it very cool stuff um, but so this is beautiful absolutely beautiful it's the uh, it's Marcel Jankovic's is the guy's name he's Hungarian and he is a legendary animator there uh and this is his definitive masterpiece uh and it's this very psychedelic adaptation of hungarian fairy tales um it says traversing uh an otherworldly canvas son of the white mare follows mythic folk heroes tree shaker stone crumbler and iron temperer uh, as they descend into the perilous underworld on an epic quest to battle the forces of ancient evil and save the cosmos. By turns astonishing and meditative, this kaleidoscopic medley of path-breaking animation styles receives its first ever U.S. release here in a new 4K director-approved restoration. Rounding out this collection is a comprehensive survey of Marcel Jankovic's famed early work, including a new restoration of Janus Vitez, the first Hungarian animated feature film, and three landmark shorts. So, again, criterion level work here. You know, not everybody realizes that there are a lot of other companies that do criterion level work, uh, but Arbelos is one of those companies. And as you can see, uh, a lot of stuff featured here, including an interview with Marcel Jankovic and uh, some archival news footage and trailer and new essays. It's got a nice booklet 
on the inside. And if you're just like an animation fan like I am, you will absolutely appreciate this this set because the you know, it is in a foreign language, but the animation is just gorgeous. I can just show you it's just this beautiful I mean, I, I was just totally floored by how how neat it was, and and I'd only heard briefly that this was even coming out, um, and so when I got it, it was a nice surprise to be like, oh wow, this is way better than I could have imagined. Um, so a really great release from Arbolos Films. Uh, I really can't recommend them enough. Like if you're not keeping an eye on what Arbolos is doing, you need to be because they're doing incredible work all the time. Uh, another one that I haven't even had a chance to dig into yet is uh, Satan Tango, the Bellatar film, because it's, I want to say it's like over seven hours long, um, but I've heard this is a beautiful restoration and has a lot of great features. Um, so Arbolos, please uh, look up their website, follow them on socials, and you will not regret it because they are doing a ton of great work. Um, next up, we have a couple from... Twilight Time, as I mentioned in a previous video, Twilight Time is back, now run through Screen Archives Entertainment, uh, the website, and so this is their third and fourth releases, respectively. This is Seven Deaths in a Cat's Eye. Uh, this one has an audio commentary with film historian Troy Holworth, and it is sort of a giallo. Uh, when a fractious aristocratic family gathers at an ancestral Scottish castle. A straight razor wielding murderer is also unwelcome. An unwelcome guest in Seven Deaths of the Cat's Eye. A blood lace thriller complete with giallo flourishes, tantalizing sexuality, a pet gorilla, and an omnipresent ginger tabby from genre filmmaker Antonio Margaretti, Anthony M. Dawson, a.k.a. Uh, Singer-actress Jane Birkin plays the willow, willowy heroine. That's really cool to see her in this. Um, whose arrival foreshadows several unnatural deaths. Hiram Keller is a possibly unhinged lord of the manor with a cursed history, and the ensemble includes schemers with homicidal tendencies, all underscored by the shuddering, shudder-inducing music of the great Ritz Ortolani, who's actually one of my favorite composers. Um, I think he did, like, tentacles and some really great scores that just have that wonderful harpsichord, you know, that really crunchy sort of harpsichord that I love in Italian scores. So this is great stylish giallo fun with a great score and uh, a great third or fourth release from uh, our friends over at Twilight Time. So I do recommend this. It comes with your disc there and a nice booklet which they tend to have a nice essay from usually um, let's see here Mike Finnegan Mike Finnegan is the guy who's doing the essays and they're all very good and uh, so you got your booklet and everything so that's another wonderful Twilight Time release I was very excited about that one and then in addition to that we have one more uh, Messalina uh, and this one is a peplum film so kind of sword and sandals. You can sort of see on the back uh, what we're talking about. This one has to do with um, uh, a rare Italian historical spectacle with a solo above title female star, the English-born Belinda Lee, as you can see her there, um, in one of the final roles of her tragically short life, playing the young beauty plucked from country life as the Vestal Ver Valeria to enter an arranged marriage with the newly crowned Roman Emperor Claudius. She captures the sexual manipulativeness and raw hunger for power of the murderous Empress of Legend. Uh, seducing highborn lovers to gain political influence, Messalina learns that balancing her grasp on the aristocracy and the common folk is hard to handle, even as she longs for her true love, the ultimately incorruptible Lucius Maximus. Uh, and this cast includes... Uh, let's see here. Spiros uh, Focus, Carlo Justini, Giancarlo, Giancarlo Sabrigia, and many other Italian actors. 
Uh, and this one, I don't know how much of a release it's had prior to this. So this may be a debut, but don't quote me on that. Um, but uh, no extra features here, unfortunately. Uh, but still, <clears throat> a nice couple next two releases from Twilight Time. Next we have a 4K pickup. I'm sure a lot of people have talked about this one, but I had to bring it up. I got this at Target, um, and I do like... I'm, I'm not a Steelbook guy, but... I've taken to collecting a few steelbooks with these 4Ks. I, I love this artwork, actually. I really think it's great. Uh, and this movie is great. This is from George Roy Hill, who had previously done uh, Butch and Sundance with Paul Newman and Robert Redford, and who would go on to do Life and Times of Judge Roy Bean with Newman and The Great Waldo Pepper with Redford, and is just a great director, just a great mythic storyteller um, who focused a lot of his work on telling stories of con men and liars. Uh, I'm quoting Quentin Tarantino, who in an episode of Pure Cinema that we did with him talked about these ongoing thematics. And he's right, it's con men and liars almost always and sometimes both. And this is obviously a con man movie, and it's really great. So you have the setup being that Robert Redford is sort of a down-on-his-luck con man who's run into some trouble with the law and has to get out of town and just happens to get uh, an invitation to go and work with another big big con man. There's little con people and there's people who do the big cons, which are elaborate and require all kinds of work and setup and people playing roles and setting up false offices and crazy stuff. And that's the kind of con that this guy does. So Redford goes to work with him and they get a big fish on the hook and the big fish is a sort of a criminal underworld type played by uh, Robert Shaw obviously pre-Jaws and they have to trick him into believing that they have some kind of gambling setup basically a rigged horse racing betting thing where they have somebody in at the telegraph office that gives them the results ahead of time so somebody will call him at a pub and give him the horse's name and he goes over and he bets at an arranged place that they've set up, an entire telegraph betting office um, that they've set up filled with actors and other con men to try and make it look legit so that they can get this guy to bet some money and eventually maybe fleece him for some money. But the whole setup is really wonderful. Uh, it's just a great, great script and just a great story with great characters. And the intertitles, they have... These wonderful, um, you know, sectional dividers that are done in the style of Norman Rockwell, where it'll say the hook, you know, the tail, um, and it'll be just different sections of the movie divided up that way. And I, I love those dividers. I think that's really neat. And of course, the wonderful Scott Joplin adapted score by Marvin Hamlish. Uh, with The Entertainer as a song that everybody knows and actually was, I guess, a big hit around the time this movie came out because this movie was so beloved and the uh, music, despite being, you know, out of time, it was actually the, the kind of music that was from an era prior to when the film takes place. Doesn't matter because it works perfectly with the film and just the whole thing is amazing. And I think people just sometimes forget how good this movie is. And the transfer on the 4K looks pretty good. Didn't blow my mind necessarily, but um, but I definitely was impressed with the upgrade from the Blu-ray. So worth getting and has a really great uh, three-part documentary on the making of the film and some other extra features as well. But uh, a nice steelbook of The Sting. I'm pulling this one in. I already sort of unboxed this, but uh, I just watched it. This is part of the... Um, homegrown horror collection from Vinegar Syndrome. They're volume one. And uh, I really dug this, Beyond Dream's Door. I had heard that um, Winter Beast is the real bonkers gem in the set, and I'm going to watch that next. But this was just really great. Um, Low-budget film made in 1988-89 by a bunch of folks, basically college students at the University of Ohio, as kind of a thesis film for most of them, I want to say. I can't, I couldn't exactly tell if the director was doing it as a thesis or I, I couldn't fully understand, but um, it's lower budget. It's shot on 16 millimeter. 
The acting is decent, but it is definitely lower budget film kind of acting. But that doesn't take away from the effectiveness of the film, which is heavily influenced by H.P. Lovecraft and features a guy who is having these nightmares, um, recurring nightmares that are concurrent. Each time he goes into the nightmare again, it sort of picks up where it left off and it becomes a thing where there's a monster sort of chasing him in it. And it's a monster that is like something out of um, the deadly spawn. If you've seen that movie, Um, really interesting, low budget, uh, effective creature feature. And the effects are, you know, they're low budget, but they work. They're shot in such a way that they are effective. They're puppeted and all obviously uh, practical. Anyway, so the, the monsters start to become loose in the real world and people that he tells his dreams about start to disappear like totally disappear, like their houses are completely erased, their phone numbers are gone. Um, And so it's this story of him trying to figure out what to do and who can help him. And it's dark and has some good creepy moments and uh, some good, like I said, lower budget practical effects. And I just really enjoyed it. Um, It's definitely a discovery for me this year. Uh, There's a brand new documentary with interviews with the cast and crew and some multiple commentaries, a new track, uh, a new new cast and crew track, a new um, uh, actor track, an old director track, an old cast and crew. I mean, it's just loaded with stuff. Uh, so highly recommend that set for this one alone. Speaking of Vinegar Syndrome, we have um, one of their partner label titles. This is from Utopia. Um, the month of June was partner label month. Uh, this was a really neat... Uh, another entry from Utopia who's doing some really interesting stuff. They've done Bloody Nose, Empty Pockets. They have done um, uh, Minor Premise. I think that's what what it's called. Um, And now this documentary about Martha Cooper, who is a trailblazing photographer in the 1970s, one of the first people to really pay attention to the graffiti scene in New York City. She was a photographer for the New York Post and was allowed at some points to just go around the city and get pickup shots of the city and, you know, people in, in the city. And she, in doing that, sort of got to certain parts of the, the city and became focused on the graffiti on the trains and buildings and eventually co- co-published uh, a book called Subway Art, I believe, that became sort of an underground hit. And it was just all the... Uh, you know, subway art on the different subway trains, uh, which is obviously a thing of the past now. But it's really neat because she's like 75 years old and it's sort of visiting with her now. And she's done many books since then and just a really incredible woman that is inspirational on so many levels. Um, And she's still shooting graffiti. Like there's some stuff where she goes, I think she's in like, I don't want to miss it feels like Germany or somewhere. And she goes out with some artists who are completely anonymous. Their faces are covered. Their voices are changed. And she's running around underground train stations with them illegally, you know, making graffiti art and taking pictures of it at 75. So she is a hip, active lady and she is really special. And this documentary was really special too. So um, I do recommend it. It has a few... Um, bonus features, some extended um, uh, interviews, and just a really nice portrait of, a, of an artist and a photographer. I, I really dug that. And then one more uh, partner label. This one is from Collective. Uh, I think it's just called Collective, one of the partner labels. Uh, it's called Donnie's Bar Mitzvah. It's brand new, but it's old in that it's um, basically set up to look like an old bar mitzvah, bar mitzvah video from 1998. You know, it's even got the bad digital transitions and, and stuff like that. But it is like a raunchy comedy from the 80s or 90s. I would put it in like the American Pie type area or maybe super bad in some ways in terms of how raunchy it gets and how silly it gets. But um, not a cast of too many that I recognized. But that even said... Uh, I found it pretty amusing. And if you're into that sort of, again, super bad-ish, raunchy comedy, um, all set 
around this bar mitzvah and shot, you know, four by three video, but it looks a little filmier than video on my TV anyway. Um, it's, uh, it's pretty entertaining stuff. I got to say a surprise gem, uh, for a comedy. Um, and it's got some extras. It has an in-character commentary track with, uh, some of the actors playing their roles (laughs) as the characters in the commentary An interview with the director, Jonathan Kaufman, and uh, some trailers and some rabbis reacting to the film. Um, but so this is neat. It's I love that they're doing, and this one's from 2019. So the partner labels of Vinegar Syndrome are, you know, some new movies, which is kind of cool. So this one is definitely fun, definitely worth looking at uh, over at Vinegar Syndrome's partner label section of their site. And then last but not least, I just got this, so it's not even opened yet, but uh, this is the Groove Tube, uh, and this is from 1974. For fans of uh, Kentucky Fried Movie and those sort of uh, Amazon Women on the Moon, those sort of anthology comedies, this is maybe one of the first ones. And it's pretty goofy. It's not as good as Kentucky Fried or Amazon Women, um, but it has a really great cast, including Chevy Chase, Richard Belzer, uh, and other folks you'll recognize. It, uh, it uses the song um, Move On Up by Curtis Mayfield. And that was one of the first times I heard that song. So I credit this film for turning me on to a really great song. Um, But yeah, it's just lots of just sketches, you know, comedy sketches. And it's very short. It's 73 minutes long. Apparently, this is a restoration by Gamma Ray Digital from a 4K scan of the 35 millimeter archival film materials. Um, So this is better than this has ever looked. This used to be on VHS. It has had a DVD release, but... Uh, I'm curious to see how this new Blu-ray looks, but if you are a anthology comedy fan, uh, definitely one you may want to consider for your, your collection. I want to say it was about 15 bucks, so not too expensive. Doesn't look like it has any extra features, but um, like I said, if you're just looking for the film and then you like goofy comedies, this might be worthwhile. Uh, but that is it. That is my update uh, for the moment. Hopefully you enjoyed this, and uh, I will talk to you guys soon. Bye-bye.